Awesome. Any questions or anything on your side? Uh, no. Okay. Maybe. We'll we'll cut Let's an actual it. introduction into the podcast when we post it, but we'll jump into it then. All right. Sounds good. Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting folks. And today we've got one of them, Fraser Kane, the man named after an asteroid. <laughs> well, I, it's a humble brag. It's a humble brag. I so you were destined for this job from from day one. There's an asteroid named after me. Oh, I like that even more. Did you yeah. have really nerdy parents? Uh, no, no. Um, there was a, an astronomer a couple of years ago who did a bunch of, uh, discovered a whole pile of asteroids and named them after various podcasters that he likes. So he named one after Phil Plate, and I think he named one after Derek and Swoopy from Skepticality, and he named one after me and a bunch of other people. And unfortunately, he, he passed away. Uh, from cancer uh, when he was like 40 years old. So it's a it's sort of a heartbreaking story, but, but it's a wonderful legacy to have named a bunch of um, asteroids after, after people. Okay. We had Isaac Arthur on recently and apparently his parents named him after Isaac uh, Asimov. So he didn't have much of a choice in terms of his uh, Yeah, birth. he really didn't. Wow. He just like fell right into his namesake. So space, you've built one of the top media and content focused platforms geared all around space and astronomy. What's, what's the story? Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I've always been a fan of space, even as a small child, right? I, uh, when I was a kid, my parents would go and take me outside to see meteor showers. And my father uh, woke me up uh, in 1981 early in the morning to watch the first launch of the space shuttle. Um, as a teenager, I bought, my own my first telescope and was out observing every night and I organized star parties as a kid and then when I went to high school I went into the journalism program and I actually kind of did the same job that I'm doing right now which is that I reported on space and astronomy news for my uh, school uh, newspaper which was pretty hilarious you know which which constellations you could see tonight etc and then I went to University of British Columbia to go into engineering and washed out, wasn't for me, um, and then went into the software industry and started a couple of software companies and, and was quite successful with that. And with one of the companies, we were working in this big web development shop in Vancouver, and I felt like I wanted a little more experience, more background in, in how to run a website just to sort of take some of those lessons and apply them back to my clients. And so I picked one of my hobbies. And of course, astronomy had been the one that I'd been interested in my whole life. And so I started this website on the side, which was Universe Today. And within a couple of months, I was just, I knew that that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. And so I would work all day in my main job and then I would come home and work for five hours at night. Uh, running this website and learning both how to be a journalist and how and just learning about space and here I am 20 years later uh, still doing universe today as enthusiastic and as excited about this as I've, as I've ever been and and will continue to do this probably for the rest of my life but now people are actually listening and you're making an impact what was the most interesting story or thing you focused on Oh, there's, I mean, there's been so many, right? Um, you have these little interesting discoveries along the way. So none of it is really most interesting. I mean, we, I've had some really memorable moments. I've had a chance to talk to amazing astronomers and astronauts. I've met with, um, you know, other, I guess, celebrities uh, in, in the field. But, you know, some real memorable moments. We live streamed the landing of the Curiosity rover on Mars. And we sort of did our own broadcast for that while NASA was doing their own. We sort of wrapped their live stream in our own live stream, but we had a whole bunch of guests, Jill Tarter and Alan Stern and other people joined us and talked about it. And that was a lot of fun. It was like this great party while we were watching this momentous event happen on the surface of Mars. And it felt like it was a proper tribute to what was going on. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, we've done just actually just on Friday, we live streamed the lunar eclipse that happened in that was visible to Europe and Africa and Australia. And we had a million people watch this live stream event of of the moon. 
uh, passing into the earth's shadow. And that was, a, that was pretty amazing to think that a million people across the world took a moment out of their day to see what was happening uh, on the moon in this, in this moment. So, uh, and then there's just been so many. I mean, we've got 20,000 articles on universe today more uh closing on a thousand videos on youtube we're just about to release the 500th episode of astronomy cast we're doing a live uh show at uh, pamela's hometown in st louis so i it's this when you do something for a long time it is just this non-stop work that is your whole life and so it's, it's hard to think of any specific, i saw a rocket launch which was really cool um, I saw the launch of the OSIRIS-REx mission out of Cape Canaveral about two years ago. I've been to Iceland to see auroras, uh, which was pretty, and, and volcanoes and stuff, and that was quite an adventure. So uh, it's kind of hard to pick any one of them out of it. How do you handle, you're obviously incredibly passionate about what you do. How do you handle the fact that much of the world has for lack of a better term, lost interest in space since the space race. It's starting to come around a little bit again, but for a while it was, it was a bit dead, at least publicly. Well, I don't think that's true. I think that there is always been an enormous enthusiasm for space and astronomy and pictures from the Hubble space telescope and, and images of the space shuttle launches and things like that. I think that media used to be a lot more excited about it. And then because media has gone through this culling process where dedicated space journalists have, have kind of had to either go mainstream, more mainstream and reduce their reporting. Back in the day when I started, CNN had Miles O'Brien who went to every space shuttle launch and did live streaming of, of the shuttle launch and they did a lot of coverage and then they fired Miles O'Brien and they cut back all of their space coverage. And so the mainstream media has done, has, has had to really dumb down their coverage for this kind of thing. But the internet has, has been able to roar forward and fill that void. When you look at Elon Musk and the number of followers that he has and how many people are enthusiastic every time he posts some obscure picture of a satellite, uh, sorry, of, of a Falcon 9 fairing recovery boat um, or the, the various drone ships or live streams of their various launches, you can see this enormous enthusiasm for what's going on. So I totally disagree with that concept. Space and astronomy is as exciting and as well accepted as it ever has. It's just that the existing distribution channels through the mainstream media have lost their, they've lost their way. They've stopped showing these kinds of things. And it's been this amazing opportunity for the rest of us who are willing to take the time to explain this stuff and, and communicate with the public. It's been a gold rush. So no, I think it's, it's people are, are, are as excited and, and will maintain and continue to be so, especially now in this renaissance that we're going through. Amazing new powerful space telescopes, ground telescopes, and then what's happening with the whole reusable launch market with, with Bezos and, and Blue Origin and SpaceX. So no, I totally disagree. Are we entering a private space race? So we we're, entering a, we're entering a space race that's, that's more complicated than that. I mean, you've got NASA returning with the space launch system, in theory, uh, and going to be sending astronauts beyond the low Earth orbit for the first time in decades. You've got a really ambitious Chinese program that is you know, pushing forward really hard to get humans to set foot on the moon. They have put up several space stations. They have sent a bunch of, of robotic missions to the moon. They are absolutely going to be sending humans to the moon as quickly as they can. Uh, you've then got the various private groups. You've got uh, SpaceX, which is, you know, one of the abilities of the BFR there, you know, their big, the big Falcon rocket is that it's going to be able to, you know, just land on the moon as one of the things that it can do. Um, and then you've got, Dark Horse, Blue Origin, and the New Glenn, and the other rockets that are coming out of them, uh, definitely you don't want to discount the richest man in the world and, and that whole process. And then you've got what United Launch Alliance is doing with their Vulcan rocket, and you've got other smaller entities as well. And then this whole revolution on the small sat 
side as well. So, so again, it's this multi-part uh, space race that's happening that is a lot more vibrant and uh, resilient than anything that's ever existed before. Yeah, we're entering a very interesting era where humanity will be going, maybe not interplanetary, but we will be going into space on a much more frequent basis. What are you the most excited about today of what you've described? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard not to get caught up in the enthusiasm of the BFR. This is the SpaceX Big Falcon rocket, although that's not what it actually stands for. Um, but that's the one that I'm going to use for your Child Safe podcast. Um, but the BFR is going to be, both halves of the BFR are going to be completely reusable, the, the upper stage and the lower stage, and the amount that it's going to be able to launch is going to be enormous. And there's never been a fully reusable rocket system that's ever existed before. So uh, SpaceX claims that they're going to run some tests next year of the spaceship part, the top part. We'll see what happens. I am... I, I, but it could be, maybe it's going to take a couple of years after that, five years after that, 10 years, who knows? That's exciting. Um, and then as well as what Blue Origin is doing. So from, a, from, that launch, from the launch side, you've got these orders of magnitude improvements in, in costs and what can be launched into space. And then you've got all of these scientific missions. Uh, the James Webb hopefully is going to launch by 2021. And then you've got all these amazing ground-based telescopes, things like the Very Large Telescope, the Magellan Telescope, 30-meter telescope. There's a ton of really amazing telescopes coming out just within the next decade. Um, and then you've got this whole revolution on the small sat satellite side. You've got these CubeSats and micro CubeSats and small rockets that can launch these things into their own orbit. So it is a really, uh, I'm sort of excited across all of these different directions. It's being democratized because the cost goes so far down that access to startups, access to individuals suddenly becomes possible. Yeah, if you, if, if, the BFR fulfills their plans, it should drop the cost of launching things into space by a factor of 10 or even 100. What becomes possible when your launch costs are dramatically reduced? It, we don't even know, and that's the whole point, right? What, what, what could we ship if air freight cost one one hundredth of what it does today? What could we ship if, if ground transportation cost one one hundredth of what it costs today. So, so we don't really know what's going to happen until this next generation of spacecraft really fly. And to have an analogy for the listeners, imagine every time you went on a plane, you had to jump out with a parachute and they crashed the plane. Yeah. That's more or less what's happening. Yeah, that's what's happening right now with rockets. So imagine you could land your rocket, refill it, launch it again. Yeah. Dramatic no decrease in yet. price. So what are your thoughts on the future space in the past has been uh, the space race was kind of a pissing contest to see if the U S or the USSR was the superior country. And yeah. we're kind of moving into the era where suddenly a lot of that's happening between governments and then between rich billionaires, but it has the same effect of accelerating space. How do you think about the politics of space and what we should make sure to avoid? Well, I mean, the, the thing that's going to truly unlock the exploration of space is going to be someone figuring out how to make money from it. That up until this point, the, the space race back in the 60s and 70s was, as you said, really about politics, about showing that you really had a more capable nuclear arsenal than your opponent. And, and that is not a long-term sustainable business model, right? I can, I can bring about a more efficient and complete apocalypse than you can. Um, so that, you know, d does not for a long-term strategy make. But now there are all these companies that are potentially looking to mine asteroids, bring resources back from space, and even construct things in space. And then you've got other ideas here, space tourism, et cetera. So, once one of those, especially space mining, right? You go and you harvest metric tons of platinum off of an asteroid and bring it back to Earth, you've made that venture profitable and that will create a gold rush, um, a space gold rush. Until we get those, that commercialization of space actually starting to happen, then 
the whole process isn't really going to take off. So that's, that's what I think what we're waiting for is somebody to make more money than they put into it. And that's what it's all, always comes down to. They're always yeah. down to the economic model. Talk a little bit more about the implications of asteroid mining on our planet and future. Well, I mean, there's a big part to this, right? Which is that we, planet Earth is the best place in the universe that we know of for life. It could very well be that it's the only place in the entire universe that, that, has, that has life, that has trees and birds and insects and, and bears and all this kind of stuff. And, and the rest of the universe could very well just be atoms and molecules collected together into various forms. And yet we are polluting our environment. We are, we are ruining the water. We are filling the air with various gases. We are ruining the landscapes and we are causing extinctions here on earth. So it really makes sense to shift all of that heavy manufacturing and polluting off of the earth and out into space. So I think from just a pure, like let's try and make earth do this one job as best it possibly can is an important reason to go to space. Now, of course you can't afford it. So, so there are resources out in space that are dramatically greater than anything we have here on earth. Individual asteroids, small asteroids, just tens of meters, hundreds of meters across are going to have more of various kinds of precious elements, gold, platinum, palladium, iridium, than have ever been mined here on earth. And there's ways that you could bring some of those materials back to earth or even just leave those materials back in space, right? Don't go back into a gravity well, take an asteroid, dismantle it, turn it into um, solar harvesting, uh, space-based mining systems, ways to create you know, manufacturing factories, manufacture finished goods in space and then bring that stuff back to earth once it's done. So I think there's, and again, we don't really know what the best situation is, but we know that we can't keep using up all the resources on earth and, and living in our own pollution. And we know that all those materials are out there in space ready for us to use. And hopefully we will figure out this, this best balance point between those two. It's Adam Smith's specialization and optimization. You don't want to you don't want to eat your dinner in the bathroom while sitting on the toilet because it yeah, exactly. It don't do work. that, and that's what we're doing. So let's do less of that, right? Let's definitely do less of that. I know you've talked a lot on your channel and on some of the some of the other mediums about terraforming underground possible civilizations and the future of humanity as we expand outward. What are your thoughts on the the best options right now for humanity? Let's say we we realize we were screwed in fifty years. The, be the best option if we've ruined the earth. Or an asteroid's going to hit us or something. Or an going asteroid's going to hit us. Well, uh, so I'm, you know, of all of the super space nerds, I'm probably the last person you want to talk to about, about living off of the earth. I think that the earth is so great and so vast and so interesting and has so many places to explore that you would be crazy to not want to live here right? It's the best. Now, I, I totally get that science fiction has given us these romantic notions of, wouldn't it be cool if you went and lived on Mars? But Mars is boring, and Mars is dead. Mars doesn't have any life on it. That if you went to go live on Mars, you would have to live in a tunnel. Well, you can live on tunnels here on Earth if you want. Go ahead, live underground, enjoy living with rock walls around you all the time and occasionally being able to look out the, the window. So, so I think it's really important for people who have this romantical notion of living on other worlds that those other worlds are probably going to mostly suck most of the time. Um, so I would say that the thing that's going to be the most useful for us to learn is how to live in space itself, for us to live in the zero gravity of of, of space or microgravity, right? To live at the Lagrange points, to build those gigantic L4 colonies, rotating cylinders that are, that are out in space where you can control all of the factors. You can control the gravity. You can control the amount of radiation that gets through and the environment that you're, that you're living in. I think those will be a lot more exotic and fun to live in 
than potentially one of these these other worlds like the moon or or Mars. But you know, everyone gets to choose where they want to live. Um, and I think going into gravity wells is a big problem. You want to deliver material to the surface of the moon, you're looking at $100,000 per kilogram right now to just send material to the lunar surface. It's expensive. And then once you're down on the lunar surface, if you want to get that stuff back out into space, you've got to spend more money to get out of the gravity well. Because even the moon has a significant gravity well. Build in space and just build space stations and make them bigger and better over time. That's my feeling. So that's where I would want us to go. And the best example of it is, is, the, is Seven Eves, which was a great um, uh, story, I mean, about avoiding a disaster here on Earth and building space colonies in an orbital ring around the Earth. And I found that re a really fascinating view for what the future could hold. It definitely seems to be the most doable. What are some of the, what are some of the health concerns or topics that most people are not aware of? Right. So, I mean, the, the, what aren't the health concerns? I mean, just to go to the surface of Mars, for example, right? The temperature is, can be hundreds, uh, can be, you know, up to a hundred degrees below zero. So it is colder than any place that's ever on earth. In other words, you're going to need a really warm coat. Um, there's no atmosphere, really no appreciable atmosphere whatsoever on the surface of Mars. So you're going to need a pressurized spacesuit to be able to exist out on the surface of Mars. Um, the, uh, the atmosphere that does exist is carbon dioxide. So you're not going to be able to breathe it. You're going to need to be able to create your own atmosphere th by accessing local resources, which are there. I mean, you can definitely find oxygen in the rocks on Mars. Uh, and there's more and more evidence of water on the surface of Mars. So, so definitely want to use that. The radiation is constant. You've got the radiation coming from the sun, from the solar wind, which is dangerous, but can be largely avoided. And then you've got the galactic cosmic radiation, which is coming very, very high energy, very dangerous particles that are coming from, from space in all directions. And those are very hard to pr protect against. Really, the only way to do that is to be to surround yourself with water or rock and for any long periods of time. So really, there's going to be a countdown clock anytime that you walk out onto the surface of Mars or the moon as the rate as you're building up your radiation load. And I know for a lot of people, they're cool with that. I mean, they don't mind having uh, an increased chance of getting cancer, but uh, still it's, it, that's bad. Um, and then I think the one that's the most problematic and we probably don't have any really good solution to is the fact that we don't have any way to be able to protect against the reduced gravity. And so on the surface of Mars, it's what, 35, 40% of, of what it is on Earth. On the moon, it's 15%. And we just don't know what happens to the human body for a long period of time, for years, living in that kind of gravity. And we don't know what's going to happen to human bodies. If you gestate a child in that kind of gravity, will, they, will their spine grow properly? Will they have problems with their organs? We just don't know. So it could very well be that that attempting to have a child in one of those other worlds is impossible. And so the only way to do that is maybe a, a pregnant mother has to live on a centrifuge for nine months while they're waiting for the child to gestate. And then the child has to grow on a centrifuge. Like at a certain point, it gets pretty complicated and you have to decide if, if that's what you want to do. While in the orbital space colonies, you can just rotate your colony to one G and and you've got all the gravity that you need. So I think that there are some serious concerns that, that haven't been, that have just haven't been addressed. And the only way we're gonna know is by practicing more living in space. And would the easiest or safest way be to somehow make an animal space colony? So I know, like if you look at sci-fi, you see the worlds that have the higher, higher gravity, you have the super short, super stocky, strong people, you have the tall people on the lower gravity, but is that actually, plausible does that make sense is another question is it doable well, having gravity that's heavier than earth is a again is an interesting question i don't think you could go beyond 1.5 1.1 1 1.05 like any he heavier gravity is going to cause all kinds of additional problems but i think you're exactly right about being a animal colonies we need to we need to understand all of the separate variables that live 
that will allow humans to live in space. And the gravity is going to be one of them. And the way you solve that problem right now is you, you know, you put animals into rotating habitats, spin them up, let them go for a couple of years and see what kind of gravity causes the, the least deformities in in animals, so I can definitely imagine Mars astro, uh, you know, mouse astronauts uh, being in their little mouse colony in rotating mouse colony for a couple of years and see what happens, and then some, you know, spin them at one G and see if they do okay, and spin them at a half G and see if they do okay, and spin them at a third G and see if they do okay. And I think that's these are the kinds of experiments, and I think that just goes back to this whole idea that that we're not as ready to live in space as we think we are. We, the, all we have done right now is spend a year at a time in a space station that is orbiting around the earth within the Van Allen belts, you know, in a place that's relatively safe. So there are so many questions that need to still be answered. We need to go farther. We need to go higher. We need to go for longer durations. We need to practice different kinds of techniques in space. We need to learn how to make the air last. We need to grow plants. We need to figure out how to provide protein. We need to how to make bathrooms better, showers, brush our teeth. Like there's just so many questions that need to be sorted out. There's decades of work that's still to be done. And I know that a lot of people are just impatient. They're like, I want to live on the surface of Mars. I think you want to learn to use a toilet that isn't a complete and total disaster. Like that's, that, that that's was my question. Challenge. Actually, it's not a serious question, but how do, how do toilets work in space? Well, they have to use vacuums, right? So, you, so it's like a cross between a vacuum cleaner and a toilet, which is as unpleasant as you can imagine. Sounds uh sounds fun. So uh, I wanted to wanted to follow up on that because it all makes a lot of sense and it's stuff that does not get spoken about enough. What areas are you most excited about? So the technologies that are converging with space that you think will have the biggest impact on society, startups, and the future. Well, I mean, the one that we've already talked about is the big one, which is this this development of reusable rocketry. That's the complete game changer. That is the foundation that changes everything. To be able to have rockets be reused is is a just leap forward, um, right? Uh, one giant leap for mankind. And I cannot wait to see what that turns into. And we don't know what the ramifications that are gonna be, that now suddenly it makes sense to launch 12,000 high-speed internet satellites into low Earth orbit to provide high-speed internet to everyone, everyone on Earth for a fraction of the cost of traditional telephone providers. You know, that's a thing that would change everything, right? So that's the big one. And everything else then is made available by that that decrease in cost in getting things into space. The other one that I think is really dramatic is space construction. So there's a new uh, new satellite called Arconaut, which is sort of a cross between a, a spider and a, and a satellite. And so you send up canisters of raw materials and the Arconaut is a 3D printer. It has it can 3D print different materials and and spin them out like a spider, and then and then it can grab them with its three little arms and construct them together. So you could give it a a tub of space plastic, and then it would turn that into a space station truss by just spinning out um, truss elements and then bolting them together and and producing uh, screws and rivets and and then bolting those together. And what was just a tub of material gets turned into a space station. And that whole technology is surprisingly well along in its development. And we could very well be nearing the end of launching very complicated satellites from Earth in one fell swoop and moving to this time when new satellites are, you know, various parts are sent up, cameras, solar panels, uh, processors, things like that are sent up to a construction facility and then the satellites themselves are manufactured in space where you don't have to worry about making them 
capable of living down on Earth gravity. The whole thing is carefully put together in space and it can be fragile because it doesn't matter, it's in space. So it's those two things, the dramatic decrease in launch costs and the ability to build things in space that I think are gonna change everything. Speaking of being easier to do, why, why put humans in space when we're doing this versus doing it with robots where it doesn't matter if a robot is destroyed? Well, I, I mean, the whole point of a human space exploration program is to put humans in space. And so you were talking about this earlier that let's go to Mars and let's go to the moon and let's build our orbital space colonies that there are, there is value to having humans in space. If any, for, if for the various smallest reason is to have that safety net, if something catastrophic happens to earth, when the, when we release the, the killer designer plague uh, or the AI robot uprising, although they could probably go to space too, but uh, the killer plague, um, the zombie apocalypse and the asteroid, when the, those things happen, then it'd be great to have humans in space and, and the solar system can accommodate a trillion human beings, no problem. So, so what is the point of sending humans to space is to learn how to send humans to space right? If you want to have humans to space, you better learn. I'll just keep going in circles here. If you want to learn to have humans in space, you've got to learn how to send humans to space. So that's the reason. Uh, but there's, and you don't need to provide any other justification. Uh, you don't need to send humans to space so they can do better science than robots. That's nonsense. Robots do really great science in space. You, all you really need to do is say, can we make a human being survive longer in space? Yes. Great. Mission accomplished. Now can we make a human survive farther in space? Yes, mission accomplished. Now can we make a human survive in space and have some food that doesn't make them sad? Yes, all right, victory. And those are the kinds of accomplishments that, that we need to work on for the human space exploration side of things. So it might sound terrible, and we talked about the, talked about the animal-based testing before, but would it make sense to have a, a sign-up for people on death row to say, do you want to go be part of a great grand space experiment? We're going to see what happens. Um, I guess. I don't know. Um, it's like Australia, right? That Australia, they sent criminals and convicts much to the sadness and surprise of the aboriginals already living in Australia. Um, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I think that the, that space requires because it's such a dangerous and challenging environment it requires teamwork and a level of grit and coolness under pressure that you need the best people who have trained for this kind of thing have demonstrated that when everything is going sideways, they can keep it together and, and, and be, keep themselves and their crewmates alive. So I don't think it makes sense to, to take random uh, volunteers or even non-volunteers, package them up in a spaceship and send them out into space. I don't think they would make the best astronauts, but but there could very well be uh, prisoners who would make fantastic astronauts. But I think you need to have a way to decide who makes a great astronaut and have that be independent from what their current career is, be it a test pilot or um, someone on death row. I see what you're saying. I meant more to, to scale up the test, but that's also a pretty inhumane way of doing it. But if I was yeah. on death row, I think that would be a great option. Right. But the, but the whole point being is if maybe that's a potential for you, but at the same time, there are other people that are depending on you and really the, the whole uh, future of human space exploration is going to be depending on that. So it's important to take the best candidates, no matter where they come from. There's a reason why we have the astronauts in there, super celebrated, successful, and generally speaking, ridiculous. Yeah, you spend any time with an astronaut and you totally understand why they are astronauts. They are smart, they are brave, they are well-spoken, they are well-educated, they, they are, in many cases, uh, the top of their field across many situations, but that is their table stakes. That's just what they do to get into the game. The, the thing that sets astronauts apart is how well they get along with other human beings. And so you spend any time around an astronaut and you're like, I just want to hang out with you people all the time, right? You're the best because they're nice and they are team players and they get along with other people and they are cool under fire and they don't think, take things personally. And they're the kind of people that you'd want to be cooped up for six months in a tuna can uh, going to another planet. 
yeah, it's really it's really easy to underestimate how hard that must be on them. I wanna yeah. I wanna shift gears a little bit. So propulsion. Let's say we can get into space, we can land, we can bring it back. What about expanding further? I know you've looked into different propulsion methods and was curious what your thoughts were on the future. Well, probably the, I mean, chemical rockets, chemical propulsion systems are going to be along with us, with us for a long time. And it's you know, here on earth, obviously you want chemical propulsion from liquid hydrogen, helium, kerosene, things like that. But out in space, the most ready form of rocket fuel that you're going to be able to find is water. And there are, is plenty of water on asteroids and comets. And so if you can go and extract water off of one of these worlds, you can separate them into their hydrogen and their oxygen and turn that into rocket fuel. Or you can just take the water itself and heat it up to steam and spew it out of your rocket and use that as a propellant. So chemical rockets are going to be with us for a long, long time. Uh, there are some more exotic propulsion systems. Uh, ion engines are, are proven um, and have operated for long periods of time and can take you to very high velocities for a, a fraction of the propellant that you might require. Uh, there's been some really interesting tests where you take fission reactors to provide the electricity to make an ion engine push at a much higher velocity. And if you remember the Martian, the, the spacecraft that was ferrying back and forth from Earth to Mars was a nuclear powered ion engine. So you can imagine that. And there's other exotic, there's nuclear rockets, which are very interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of solar sails and electric sails and plasma sails, ways that you can just use um, photons streaming off the sun and the plasma environment to be able to get you around the, the solar system. I think the thing that's going to be most important is really just a sense of, of just having infrastructure. So we're going to get to this point in the future where you're going to have a refueling depot at the... Earth, Sun, L2, Lagrange point, and then you can use that as a way station to then head off to Mars or Jupiter or places like that once we get more and more of those of that infrastructure. So we're, for the next feasible future, we're not going to see propulsion systems that are dramatically different from what we have today. If you want to go to Mars, you want to take the, the least propulsion method that you can that allows you to get there, and that's the... and those have been used for decades and will probably be used for, for a long time into the future. So I want to, I want to shift gears a little bit. A big part of Fringe FM is getting incredibly interesting people on who are highly focused in specific areas and finding out outside of their interests, what else are they interested in? So what, what would you say you look into? What are you obsessed or passionate about besides space? Besides space? Um, uh, yeah, it's funny, right? Cause it's sort of all consuming. Uh, when I'm not, uh, I, I may, uh, this is, this is funny. So my wife is a nature photographer. And uh, so I get as obsessed about that as I do with, with my work, but I get to be the assistant. So we'll go on these um, uh, trips. We were, we, we just came back from Australia. We've done Costa Rica. Uh, we've done uh, the deserts of, of Oregon and a bunch of other places. And, and it's all about, her she's the one who's taking the pictures and i'm along for the to provide logistics and to be a spotter so that we can i can spot targets that she can shoot and i really enjoy that role of being not the one who's responsible for creating the the, the photographs and things like that i just get to help her do her job better so that is that is a big chunk of you know when i'm not doing this um and also, I happen to live on this beautiful place in the world. I live on Vancouver Island, and it is just wonderful for exploring. So when I'm not trapped in my uh, space dungeon, I'm, uh, I'm out hiking, mountain biking, swimming. We have this beautiful river that we swim in all the time. In the wintertime, uh, you know, it rains, but it's still reasonable. So uh, it's, yeah, it's such a beautiful environment. So you said earlier that you were one of the few space-focused folks that was actually much more excited about Earth than the prospects of expanding. Do you think this is why? And the fact that a lot of, a lot of people that are more focused on space in the future tend to be a little bit nerdier and less outdoorsy? <laughs> well, no, no. I think, I think that it is a process that you go through. When you start learning about space, you want to learn about the Fermi Paradox, 
you want to learn about warp drives. You want to learn about wormholes and black holes and, and white holes and, and the big picture stuff. You're trying to take science fiction and you're trying to map it to reality. And over time that you kind of put away those I, like childish things, you know? So you, you stop kind of going, well, where's my warp drive? And you start being fascinated by the kinds of propulsion systems that are actually available. And you start to understand the nuances of it. Um, and I think you get that same situation happens really in any field that you get interested in. You start out, if you want to get into woodworking or if you want to get into filmmaking or you want to get into hiking or anything, admiring the, the best of the best, the greatest things that are possible. And then after a while, you start to build this really nuanced idea of it. And I think it's this process. And so, for example, on my YouTube channel, a lot of people really appreciate that, that I'm not looking really deep and far, far, far into the future. I'm a lot more interested in what's happening right now. What are the new advances? What are the technologies that are being worked on that are going to take us to the next level? It's the, it's the incremental steps that move us forward in this journey. It's the, and I feel like it's more of a, uh, a it's just this, it's this process that we all go through. We start out and going like, I want to talk about Dyson spheres. And then after a while you're like, I'm a little bored of talking about Dyson spheres. Let's, Talk about um, uh, small scale orbital uh, centrifuges or uh, interesting new discoveries in adaptive optics or, you know, the practical things that are actually happening right now today that are pushing this whole endeavor forward and you get into it. And I, I'm sure it happens in the same, it is like, man, like some kind of sports analogy, right? Those people who show up every four years and, and watch the World Cup and they have no context for, for what, is, what the teams are and what the sport, you know, what are all the stories and so on. And they're like, uh, they're there because they kind of enjoy watching soccer and they're the best games. But it, for a small diehard pe group of people, they understand the names of the players on every one of the teams and they know the story and they know the drama and they know the, the they have this view of everything that came together. And so when they watch the World Cup, they get so much more context out of it because they're like, oh, you know, I know that that player is suffering from a really bad thigh injury that he got in the last game. And, and all of those are so much more meaningful. So I think it is this... I hope that that we who are interested in this, we move through this journey from starting out being very enthusiastic and hoping to see sci-fi turn into reality. And the reality is far more interesting and nuanced and wildly entertaining as you spend more time uh, in the middle of it. The only thing I would push back on that is the the danger of becoming realistic. Because oftentimes the people that, change the paradigms are the ones that think outside the box and don't realize that the impossible was in fact impossible, which was in fact possible. Yeah. Well, and, and I mean, I think that's my goal is to be wildly enthusiastic as much as I can about what's going on and to really appreciate those out of the box ideas, electric sales, um, plasma sales. Can you talk uh, a little more about how those work? Electric sails. Well, I mean, so there are, I mean, we know about solar sails, which are the, the light pressure that's coming from the sun that can be used as a way to push a spacecraft out into space. And there is also the charged particles that are coming from the sun. The, and you can have a, a spacecraft reel out these little thin wires and then, the, and then rotate and they'll be taut so imagine like a ferris wheel almost and then as the solar wind passes through these you know electrified wires you get a thrust and it's very it is thought to be very effective very powerful very efficient way to be able to move out into the into the solar system and so i think that there is there are plenty of these out of the box thinking, fully reusable spacecraft, um, uh, adaptive optics, uh, interferometry, where you combine the light of various telescopes together, that's gonna keep people busy. And I think it's always important to, to 
embrace those ideas and to try, I mean, my sadness is that a lot of those ideas just take so long for people to recognize and try, be willing to try them out. The ion engine is a good example. I mean, the ion engines were, were, was first tested decades ago, but it took uh, the Deep Space One spacecraft, which was really just a collection of experiments for people to be willing to try an ion engine on a actual live spacecraft and it worked beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. And now the Dawn spacecraft uses it, the Hayabusa spacecraft use it, uh, Europe's Smart One spacecraft used it, and I would love to see more. So I think that there are a, a lot of really amazing technologies that are real, right? Instead of trying to, like, by all means, if someone figures out how to make an Alcubierre drive go, great, I love it, do it. Make, let's, I want to go to other worlds. Um, but until then, there's tremendous benefits to be gained from, from working on ion engines and plasma drives and, and learning how to grow plants in space. So there's, there's, there's lots and lots of work to go. There's a ton of work to do. If you were a student today, what would you study and why? Well, I think that, it, I mean, it depends on what you want to go into, right? And, and I think for the people who want to go into pure astronomy, they want to be an astronomer, that's a really rough field to get into. There's not a lot of jobs. They're very competitive. And so my recommendation is to go into a field like computer science because actually astronomers now are computer scientists. All astronomers know how to code in Python, crawl through databases, download information. And a lot of work is being done in, in databases. When you look at some of these new modern telescopes, they are generating terabytes every day of, of data. And so if you can go into the computer science side of things and you still want to be an astronomer, then if, if you can't get a job as an astronomer, you can always get a job as a computer scientist. There's a million jobs in computer science or engineering or things like that. So that's my advice is that if these things fascinate you approach them from the computer science or engineering point of view. And if the pure field that you wanted to go into doesn't happen, then you can go and, and do other fields. That's a, that's a very good feedback. Essentially learn the tools and skills needed to be applicable to anything. Yeah. To be anything. And then if it turns out that you can't get a job as a professional astronomer, you can get a job as an AI researcher and make hundreds of thousands of dollars at Google, which is a, a, an okay you know, second career. Yeah, it's not bad. And then if you feel really bad about it, donate some of the money to space. Yeah. Yeah. And then be a, then buy a telescope and do some hobby astronomy. And in fact, as you know, I mean, amateurs are getting involved in all kinds of citizen science projects all the time. I mean, there's, there's what we do with Cosmo Quest and there's Galaxy Zoo. And there's a lot of ways if you are a motivated amateur to make a significant contribution to the field of astronomy. Yeah. We're wikipedia -fying the world. Yeah. What would uh what job would be what job would pull you away from what you're doing now? Who would have to come calling? I can't imagine. I've uh, it's it's funny. Um, I about two years ago, or I guess about four years ago, I took on a job with an old friend of mine to be the product manager for Hero X, which was an offshoot of the X Prize, and we were trying to learn how to make the X Prize. Uh, sort of for a everyone. X Prize is for anyone. Anyone who wants to run their own X Prize, they could do it. And Hero X is still doing great. And at the end of two years, I had to resign. You know, my best friend offered me my dream job working for one of my heroes um, and uh, with the X Prize. And um, where, where I got to define my job and make a significant impact on the world for a good salary and I still couldn't do it. I had to come back to universe today. I just love this job so much. So I can't imagine anything that would drag me away from, from what I'm doing. I work the hours I want to work. I work on the content that I want to work. I get to have a meaningful, I think contribution to what I'm doing. I get to make great friends. I get to talk to astronauts. I get to watch rockets launch. It's, it's the dream career. Sounds good luck. Cool. Someone trying to tear me away from this. Sounds pretty cool. What, yeah. uh, Let's, uh, I know researchers and people that are, consider themselves scientists hate to make predictions. So let's jump into predictions. Give sure. Me a, a ten I year, love to make predictions. Give me a 10 year and a hundred year bold prediction. Sure. So 10 year, I think we're going to see someone crack the reusable rocket problem. So maybe the BFR, maybe the, the new Glenn, or maybe something else. One of those companies, be it 
United Launch Alliance or Blue Origin or SpaceX or one of the Chinese organizations or you know the Russians, one of them is going to crack reusable rockets. And so I think that what comes after that is like, it's like the singularity of rocketry, right? We don't know what happens when you've got AIs making better AIs. It's hard to predict what comes after that. And so I think that that if that revolution comes to pass, then it's really difficult to predict what comes after that when the cost of launching things is dramatically lower. We could very well, and then when you look forward to that 100 years from now, I think we're going to have a significant presence in space. We are going to be utilizing the resources of space, be it power, um, uh, raw materials, to a dramatic amount. And we're going to be using those for the benefit of of humankind uh, for, and hopefully that will have made the earth a better place, a, a more sustainable place, a place that's better for life. Um, we are going to have, what, 100 years from now, I think we will have thousands of people who live in space in some kind of orbital um, existence and probably research stations on the moon and Mars. My feeling is that the amount of people who want to live on the moon and Mars are going to be fairly low, but we're going to have research stations and people going there for tourism. But I think the vast majority of humans are going to be living just in, in space itself is my feeling. And it's going to be in the thousands, but I, uh, 200 years, it could be in the billions and a thousand years, it'll be in the trillions. Yeah, the space versus the space versus Mars comparison is: Do you want to live on a yacht or in Antarctica? It's a, yeah, it's a similar yeah. comparison. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're what, both though. Do you want to live on a yacht, a yacht in Antarctica, or do you want to live in Antarctica? We'd probably still take the yacht. Yeah, but, still um, take the yacht. What uh, what worries you today? Uh, well, I mean, I have the same kinds of existential dread that Elon Musk and a lot of other people do about the kinds of existential crises that we live in today. I mean, the AI, the potential of AI is one big one, just the unintended consequences of making really smart computers. I mean, our dumb computers are dangerous right now. Computer bugs happen all the time and cause all kinds of catastrophes. I can't imagine if you give a self-improving artificial intelligence the ability to make itself better and, and with bugs or not really thinking through what it should do. Uh, an even bigger issue is the potential of bioengineering and genetic manipulation. We're at the point now where you can, for a reasonable amount of money, use CRISPR to be able to create your own modifications to various life forms. That power is going to get easier and easier and easier and allow what may take a research institution or a government institution eventually is going to happen with a small private firm and is eventually going to happen with a person working in their basement. And if you could give the ability to wipe out humanity to any one person on earth, it's inevitable that someone would pull that trigger, right? So I think these are the kinds of existential crises that we're going to have a really hard time being able to prevent. And that's one of the reasons why going to space is so, is so important. Those are the ones that I'm most concerned about. And then I'm concerned about the various things that we're doing to our planet, be it climate change, be it the pollution um, and the, the way we're wiping out life forms on our planet. And that's why I'm so enthusiastic for space is that this is going to be our way to take that pressure off the planet and, and start to use those resources from space. So I'd say those are the, the big ones, the, 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 the extinction level events followed by the, the slow polluting garbageification of the, of the planet. So basically short-term thinking and playing offense instead of defense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, right? Like, let's get, let's take these problems seriously and let's come up with some serious solutions to them as opposed to freaking out after the fact and, and coming up with band-aid band solutions. I'm less concerned about, say, an asteroid strike. The chance of a catastrophic asteroid wiping out humanity is fairly remote. They would be a bad day if one hit a populated center 
but it's not the 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 level the you know and now the number of asteroids that have been mapped out tells us with a high degree of certainty that we don't have any planet killers coming our way but still after a while like by all means let's map out the asteroids and let's turn the 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 bad behaving asteroids into uh space telescopes and even then with the space killers i mean the dinosaurs were virtually wiped out but life still survived on the planet We've got to think we're a little smarter than a dinosaur. Or... Yeah, but the dinosaurs didn't appreciate what happened to them. Oh, no, not at all. They yeah. Know. So, yeah. you know, part of it is that you specifically want to be able to enjoy the future. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not, you know, I mean, yes, the octopuses will eventually rise up and take over the earth after we're all long gone, but it would be nice to be able to participate in that future side by side with our future octopus overlords. God, if you ever see an octopus, it looks like pure ancient evil. It looks like some species evolved on another planet that's come straight out of a sci-fi movie. It's yeah, like, there is an absolute yeah. intelligence going on there. So I know we've had you on here for a while. You've got a lot going on. The last thing we always like to leave people with is, what's something you would like to leave listeners with? A quote, an action item, something to look into or do? Wow. Um... I don't, man, that's a, t that's a tough one. Um, I think when it comes to sort of what I've been able to do as a career, I think it's, I think it's, it's important to show up every day and, and do the work and you'd be amazed what you can accomplish over a long period of time. If you're patient and you're willing to work really hard and try to make a difference in, in terms of, of space, I think you don't have to, I think things are great. Things are better now than they've ever been. This is absolutely a renaissance and a, uh, an amazing time to be interested and involved in space exploration. And don't let the haters get you down saying that people aren't interested in this kind of thing anymore. It is awesome and getting better every day. We are definitely on the upswing. There's a lot of interest and excitement. Where's the best place for people to find you, say hey, and learn more about what you do? Sure, yeah. So there's a couple of things that I'm really proud of. Obviously, uh, there's Astronomy Cast, which is the podcast I do with Dr. Pamela Gay. You can get that wherever fine podcasts are made. Uh, I do this video series on YouTube called The Guide to Space, which I'm really proud of with Chad Weber, who's my, my editor. Um, and then, of course, I'm, I'm at Universe Today or at F, F. Kane on all the various social platforms and of course our website universe today and of course guys we'll throw links and everything in the show notes hopefully this has been fun i always like jumping out into space and thinking it through and uh i know i know frazier obviously does as well all right well thanks for having me matt yeah thanks guys and cheers